Are you curious about how the top end of E7 plays? Well, today I have a bit of content for you involving a tournament or a PvP competition that recently happened involving Epic 7 and App Gallery. Before I get into it, I'd like to give a huge shout out to Valk, uh, Divine, and all the casters, content creators, Car6, everyone that was involved with the production and the casting of this tournament. Because, of course, the only way for me to even see any of these matches or for us to have any of these matches is with the kind help of these individuals. Thank you again. Now, you're probably wondering why I'm even covering this. Is it important? What's the purpose of me doing this? And the purpose for me is to actually give you a bit of an insight as to what random, wacky, what meta, what, what kind of consistent picks are being played in RTA and then use that to kind of give you a brief overview as to what you can expect what kind of things you can expect, not just from the tournament, but also the actual RTA ladder. And hopefully that either helps you in terms of building your account, playing certain ways, et cetera, et cetera. Let's get into it. So the first match that we have to talk about, as you can see in the background, is a match between Biru and Rikazu. The reason why this match is so significant is because both of these players are very highly rated, either in the past or currently, Biru being a very high tier top 50-ish kind of legend player at the moment, and Rikazu being someone that has historically finished legend. And the other reason why I wanted to bring up the series is because the picks and the drafting of this whole series was extremely, extremely peculiar, especially once you compare it to the later matches. Now again, I'm not going to go too far in depth with the picks or analysis of what's good or what's not, because ultimately these players play very differently from I do, and I think it's just kind of worth noting that again, this was by no means a normal match. I mean. I mean, for Pete's sake, guys, we're, we're seeing Dragon King Sharuna. This character has been seen very infrequently, if at all. And that statistic is only matched by how frequently we've seen Laika or even Arunka, who's even more ridiculous and a special pick. Now, before we get into the next match, I just want to spoiler alert that, of course, we're going to be going through the matches. You'll see some of the, the match histories. If you don't want to see the outcome of these matches, feel free to click off. But something that I thought was absolutely ridiculous by this match is that although a lot of the picks on left and right side don't seem that ridiculous. You see a Rowana post buff. You see Briar Witch, Bunny Dom, Faithless Utica, on occasion, Spectre Tenebria. The actual compositions and the way that they actually were picked together looks absolutely ridiculous. Now, you're probably also wondering where all the Elbruses in the game are, i.e. through the Navy Captain Landy or the Abyssal Yuffie, but thankfully for the series, we actually ended up having them banned immediately. Now, unfortunately for game two, things happened, but ultimately nothing super out of the ordinary occurred just because of the way that the draft was, but ultimately, kind of interesting, not a super conventional draft. Let's move on to game three. Now, if you could even believe it or not, Game three was even more ridiculous looking. And although you see like the early specimen says, and you see stuff like Conqueror Lilius, Gala, Arrowall, nothing super crazy outside of again, to literally everyone's surprise by our fourth and fifth pick, we saw Benny Morrow and Wanda locked in together. Now, I don't want to spoil exactly how these things went, because of course, I think that seeing matches live or seeing it for yourself and how well they worked out is part of the charm and part of the excitement, especially when new and inventive picks come out. So I'll leave this match for you. But in terms of this overall series, take a look at this match. This one was crazy. But as we move into game four, something that we kind of noticed getting developed was the pick of Solitaria into the ML Shu. Now, if you're not familiar with the matchup, something that is really big about Shu is that when she gets her buff, the bzzz buff, uh, she starts injuring characters. However, if you can stun her, if you can push her back, or if you can unbuffle her, she doesn't gain access to this buff. And then she doesn't do all the injury outside of her, you know, her S3. But although the draft looks semi-normal at other parts, again, seeing stuff like maybe the Faithless Lydica and a Moon Bunny, which is not the most insane thing ever, we once again saw Wanda, which is absolutely ridiculous because, again, who is picking Wanda this much? But although the last two picks were definitely weird looking, we had Aria, we had Elagos, which again, both ended up getting banned, so it didn't really matter anyways. When you take a look at actually how the match worked out, this Wanda pick had huge value. So again, as you see here, we have the Faith of Zetica going first, Faith of Zetica resetting, Moon Bunny giving attack buff, and after this very huge nuke onto the Angel of Light by the ML Shu, we got to see the real highlight of the match, which again, is just Wanda one-shotting Aiden, and you would expect from this position, the Laia is already reset, the Faith of Zetica is stealth, and all you have are a bunch of Guiding Light characters and Shu in the match, you would expect that the match would be pretty Rikazu or right side favored. Now, ultimately, what ended up happening, to give you a bit of context for why things happen, why he ended up not, I guess, being able to capitalize as much, you're looking at the character right there that ended up unbuffabling, stealthing, debuffing, all these annoying, really, debuffs, 
all these annoying different utility aspects in terms of damage and also stuns and debuffing that ended up actually outpacing Rikazo, and that kind of gave Delia enough time to get her skills off and also debuff and not really get injured too much by the shoe. But of course, that leads us then to a game five. Now, if you take a look at the ending draft between both of these players, you can kind of see how Rikazo was very much on the offensive. He picked characters like Strays, Little Queen Charlotte, Faith is Lydica, and the enemy opponent, Biru, was definitely a more on the defensive, which can definitely work against characters, especially like Strays, when you have characters like Karina. But to be completely honest with you, I kind of expected things to be a little bit different, especially after I saw how the matches kind of played out. As you can see here, Faith is Lydica used her skill too, and for me personally, I'm kind of of the opinion that Karina is disturbing and I don't like playing against her. However, I kind of expected the Little Queen Charlotte to nuke the ML Shu and the Karina to be reset. But interestingly enough, Faith of Slitchka ended up resetting the Shu, which is an interesting choice. And see if you could notice what ended up throwing things all out of whack. Did you catch it? That's right, this Little Queen Charlotte is not actually on Benny Morrow's Tachi, which is originally what I and I think a couple other people had originally thought that this LQC was going to have. When Rikazo ended up picking Strays and LQC together, I understand that one of them had to have the Benny Morrow's Tachi and the other couldn't, but ultimately picking both of those characters kind of insinuated or, or kind of indicated or kind of, I guess, previewed the idea that this Little Queen Charlotte would be a little bit faster, would be able to one-shot the ML Shu, and then kind of set in motion this 3v4 where Laia could maybe outpace with Aiden, Aiden puts invincibilities, Laia gets to reset things, but actually there was not enough tempo in terms of the Little Queen Charlotte because take a look at how much damage this S3 did. Well, not enough to one-shot the Karina. I'll spare you exactly how the ending went and you can take a look for yourself, but let's move on to the next series. Now, after that first series from Biru and Rikazo, you'd expect things to maybe enter a whole different dimension in terms of quirkiness or interesting builds, etc., but we got a little bit of the opposite, specifically because although XLR is definitely a bit of an interesting creative player, you can kind of see how the meta blocks out a bit of his picks with this right side draft from Winter Wish. And ultimately, through game one, we saw exactly what the meta does when you aren't prepared for it. Now, of course, there was some intrigue to the kind of way that things were going to be played. It was a Zeo, Arrowell, Briar, which I Syria draft into an Ed. And ultimately, although things looked kind of interesting in terms of the tuning you know people wanting to doing death breaks we ended up soul burning actually onto the ed here which i thought was an interesting choice as well but unfortunately with just the way that things were tuned and the way that things ended up panning out there wasn't actually enough damage to kind of set things into overdrive and of course right here you could see just how unfortunate things kind of ended up being because the zeo ended up getting provoked by the ed and i'm sure that the zeo actually wanted to one shot the ocean breeze luluka here but he was unable to because of course he ended up having the provoke game one looked a little bit weird but we won't be seeing anything like that again now normally i would go through a bit of the matches to kind of explain what went right what went wrong but also Ultimately, between a lot of these matches in the series, there was a lot of exchanges of Aiden, Knockwall, Candy, Yuffie, and etc. And if I just kind of hyper pivot through some of these matches, some interesting notable picks that we ended up seeing here were stuff like Dark Corvus. We ended up seeing an Operator Cigarette, which is really crazy. But ultimately, because Dark Corvus ended up being sent through or getting through the draft, it ended up kind of ending really quickly without Operator Cigarette even really mattering. Operator Cigarette pretty much had to just get one shot, and then the second that that ended up happening, all that Dark Corvus had to do was one-shot the Abyssal Euphine and bing bang boom. Like that, we went straight on to game three. Now again, if you just take a look at the draft, we don't even have to go super in-depth with the actual gameplay of what ended up happening. A lot of this is just an exchange of Knockwall versus Abyssal Euphine versus Moon Bunny versus Stene, who has Briar, who has Aiden, who got LRK, who has Ed. Very meta in terms of what people kind of expect when you're playing aggressively, but we got to see some fun picks. But ultimately, what I want to talk about is our game four. Now, something worth noting about this game four is that first and foremost, of course, you can see that XLR won the match before, and now XLR is the one that has the Abyssal Euphine. There's a little bit of, you know, RNG starting to happen. You see a bit of aggressive picks. You see Politis, you see Moon Bunny, you see Para, which is one of the more uh, niche, but still very relevant picks, especially in RTA right now. And we actually end up seeing a second Elagos after his buff, which again gives him Guiding Light, which of course is kind of worthwhile noting because he does a lot of damage. Elagos here has the opportunity to kind of just one-shot the Aiden if he's not banned. As you can see here, he could definitely do a lot of damage to the enemy team just by one-shotting the Aiden here, 
Let's see what happens though. Okay, now to start off the match, we have Pera who gives herself the attack buff and the escort to her entire team. And if you take a look at the right side right now, there's no mitigation whatsoever. And you would expect with a guy with a big gun and the ability to just, and you would expect a character like Elagos who normally typically at this point runs something like Misha or Hit Chance Artifact to one shot the Aiden, they just one tap the Aiden and then kind of make it a bit of an unfair fight. Now it's a four versus three. Look at what happens next. Cool looking animation and that's right. Did you just catch what happened? Not only did this Elagos end up actually not critting the Aiden, not a single debuff ended up landing on this character. So even if we ended up having a Elbris or something from the Abyssal Euphine, there was basically no real way for the Abyssal Euphine or anyone on this left side team from XLR from actually dealing with the Aiden. And that felt really terrible. To move things along, the match ended up poorly for XLR and we moved into another game five. Now, if you take a look at this game five, this was an absolute cleave fest. We have the very traditional cleave with Stuff like Ludwig, maybe a Peyra, a Moon Bunny, Commander Pavel, Ashmancer Elena. Now on the right side here, you see we have a bit of tank down. We have Spectre Tenebria, of course, just because she's very versatile. But then we have Abyssal Euphine, the Elbruses, Eaton, the huge mitigation, the Aureus, and then we even have Sage Ball. But as the game of the series that I definitely think is worth watching for you guys, all I can say is that what comes around goes around. I highly recommend you watch game four and game five right next to each other consolidated to kind of give you a narrative of what's about to happen. I hope you enjoy. Okay, now something worth noting about the finals of this series is that both Biru and Kukrabat are extremely, extremely kind of standardish, very meta playing kind of players. And as you can see here, although there was even a DJB in this match, pretty much everything that you see here is ordinary, something that you may see uh, in RTA right now. But although the prior matches we had talked about were very interesting, they had a lot of cleave, they had Peyra, they had Knockwall, there was a bunch of Ludwig, there was different kinds of cleaves, there was Wanda. Spoiler alert, this final series did not have a lot of that. Now early on, as you could tell, a lot of these matches were Spectre Tenebria and Candy versus Euphine, who has the Rowana? Is there a Conqueror Lilius? Is there Abyssal Euphine? Who has Laia? Things that are very, very prominent right now in Epic 7, especially in the RTA scene. But throughout the series, the theme of the match was, is Rowana actually good enough to counter all the counter characters in the game, like Abyssal Euphine and Candy? Is Solitaria also good enough to deal with some of the other picks like Shu and stuff? But even though there was a very interesting kind of pivot in game two, where Kukrabat ended up using Peyra and Ludwig kind of as a pivot, and then ended up using a Zahawk to kind of counter the Aiden here. It ended kind of in tragedy. If you want to relive the agony with me, you can see right here that after the Zahawk uses the skill 3 on Aiden, there wasn't a crit. So ultimately, you can imagine how this match ended up panning out because, of course, there was no kill onto the Aiden. Abyssal Euphine was kind of struggling. But at the end of the day, guys, this is definitely a series that was worth taking a look at because ultimately, this is essentially what you would see on the ladder, especially if you see people that are playing Laia, Abyssal Euphine, Candy, are not very aggressive or very cleave heavy and are kind of just specifically interested in playing stuff like Candy and the counter characters in the game. By game four, although we definitely did end up seeing some interesting picks like Falcon or Clary in the Lone Crescent Bologna, ultimately, they weren't enough to deal with the strength of arguably two of the most annoying characters in the game, which is, of course, the salvoing on your screen right now, Navy Captain Landy and Abyssal Euphine. And if you wanted to see exactly what happened in each of these matches, I'll leave the links for all these matches or take a look at the App Gallery Cup if you're interested. But I thought as a fun treat and kind of coincidentally, since Biro ended up winning the entire tournament, congratulations to Biro, I thought it would only be fair if I had the winner of the entire tournament have a winner's interview after his match. And of course, guys, here we have a winner's interview with Biro. Biro, if you'd like to introduce yourself, do any little casual plugs, whatever, go ahead. Hello? Uh, my name is Biru. Uh, I've been playing E7 for like two years, almost. So Biru, after your convincing win, convincing or not, Elbrus is super OP, uh, I have a couple questions for you. The first question I have for you is who were you most afraid of going into the tournament or were you afraid of anyone at all when you were going into this tournament? Okay, so my hardest matchups is probably Rikazo from Feritas. The reason why is I really hate 
play for the stat prevents because it forces me to like pick like unorthodox units and yeah because it's probably my hardest match up followed by super bad but 3-1 3-1 so you know hard harder not very good very good the next question that i have is how long or did you prepare at all for the matches or as a follow-up uh, were there any secret pocket picks, things that you wish you had displayed or you kind of brought out but you weren't able to? I don't prepare anything in particular versus anyone. Just prepare my mental and gotta be there. Also, I just played TFT the, like, like the whole month, so like I was kind of I was kind of rusty at one point. So like yeah, usually my first games of the series, I just shit my pants, and yeah. I think that kind of sums up what my preparation for this tournament. Uh, tournament. Third and final question uh, for you, Biru. What do you think of E7's meta right now and, you know, as the winner? And do you think there's anything that needs to be changed? Anything that you would remove, nerf, etc. about the game? The E7 meta right now, on RTA at least, is like reading your opponent p bands basically. Like, you gotta figure out what they're trying to do. I think like game one on my match versus Kukubat is a really good example. For instance, like I pick Conchalilius and the Zio was free ban, so he picked Pera, meaning that he can pick Pera safely without getting outsped by by anything. Maybe except for like a faster run and all that. Like it's just like it's just like reading what the opponent pre bans and then play around your course. I my course basically is like Conquer Lilius, Arwell, and then like Navy Captain Landy, and then I just play around that like almost all game just pick like the good units and like on my game three and game two you can probably see what the current state of e7 is like this elvis that's probably the matter right now the change that i would probably like the most is probably to refer the card thingy like the profile card thingy so that you can see your name that thing is too wild bro like you never know like someone who has like 300 er on every unit and it's kind of pissing me off sometimes but <laughs> i think like cliff is too broken i, I have to say cliff is like way too broken this, this season so yeah okay well thank you again biru for your time your insight congratulations again on winning the app gallery tournament and hopefully you have more success maybe you'll end legend this season again who knows i'm sure we'll see you in the season though thank you again if you want any final plugs Feel free to do that now. I would like to shout out Bob, uh, Michael Fitz, and Dirk the Jack for helping me throughout the tournaments uh, and cheering me on. Basically, like I saw them like like staying up late. So yeah, shout out, shout out to them. And yeah, that's basically it. Also follow my Twitch on twitch.tv slash Biru. <laughs> yep. And there you have it, guys. That was our interview with Biru. Thank you again for watching this little interview and this video in general guys i hope you enjoyed if you did make sure to like comment turn the notification bell and subscribe no, no, no. turn the notification bell and subscribe i'll see you guys on the next one if you enjoyed content like this make sure to let me know down below guys i'll see you all next time good night adios